Welcome to North Carolina wine country. We are here at Jolo Winery here in beautiful North Carolina. And I'd like to ask you what inspired you to make wine in North Carolina and what continues to inspire you? Sure, you know, that's an intriguing question. So the romance of wine with the ability to have it be multi-generational, I was bit by the bug where someone could plant the vine today and their great, great, great grandkids could harvest grapes from that same vine and make wine that could be cellared that their great, great grandkids would consume. So that multi-generational aspect really intrigued me. When my wife and I had a chance to do something different in our lives, we decided, you know what, let's do that and raise our kids in a vineyard and a farm and under the sunshine. And based on the research, we thought that it'd be great to get in more on the ground floor of North Carolina. So we decided to be part of the process of building versus com coming in late and trying to fit in. So we figured we'd get here early and try to stand out. JW, could you please tell us about your award-winning wines? It'd be my pleasure. Thank you. So, you know, we went into this endeavor trying to create a, you know, world-class environment. For me, being a traditionalist, I want to make wine that's pure, that represents the location here in North Carolina. I like to have a lot of acid and backbone of my wine for longevity, for food pairings. So when I have a sip of this, I want another sip, and I, when this glass is gone, I want another glass. If I don't feel that way, it's not right. So we want to have a wine that is represented by the terroir, if you will, and what we grow. And that's why everything here is on sloped land. The land that we purchased all has beautiful undulations, a lot of runoff, even though we had a lot of rain. So it's good and bad. It's hard farming, but it's good winemaking practices, especially in inclement weather. So we wanted to have a world-class rosé sparkling, a world-class Blanc de Blanc sparkling, a world-class rosé, a white blend, a Chardonnay or oak-aged reds, a single varietal that's more like a, a Pinot Noir in style, hence the Pinot Noir style bottle in the same way I make the wine and the Delastage method of Burgundy, France to make it more approachable, drinkable, lower acidity and a more refined wine. Then I have some single varietal big bowls like a Cabernet Sauvignon or a Malot. <laughs> okay, you have won numerous wine competitions and a head judge in a major competition was quoted as saying, and this is pretty, this is pretty phenomenal for him to say this, when a wine from North Carolina wins best in show, it is reminiscent of the judgment of Paris moment. What was that wine? Yeah, great question. It's actually this one right here. And uh, as serendipity should have it, the same competition occurred Sunday. Mm -hmm and it's never been done before, it repeated. Different vintage. So this is the 2022 Jolo Pink, our world-class rosé. This is a 23, and the 22 won last year Best of Show. This year's 23 won Best of Show, the same exact competition two years in a row, back to back. Only 4% of us in the world make what I call an intentional rosé. So um, what is it about the American wine competition that draws you to, you know, put your wine in there? Sure. So yours is probably, I would say, the most prestigious. It's uh, one of the largest in the country. Everybody I know participates in that competition. So to be judged there, in my opinion, gives a much larger audience and more of an appeal maybe to even our wine club members and guests like, oh geez, you're American Wine Society and you won best of show because right. you judge a lot of wines. Yes, we do. And, um, and which wine won? So um, this wine, Crimson Creek, which is made from the Chamberson or Chambersin grape, mm -hmm. which is a grape that's indigenous or created in the Loire Valley of France. What I found the first year making, it's actually very delicate. So it's, um, uh, it takes on oak flavors very quickly. You get a lot of the smokiness. That's why it ages very briefly. To me, this has plenty of oak, but it has a lot of um, youthful aromatics like bright cherry. And now I get rose petals on this. I can smell it out of the glass right now. That it, right, the smell just wafts out of this glass, but I get some of that smokiness, like a little mocha and shaved chocolate. And um, as you mentioned, so nothing to being braggadocious, I'm just reporting <laughs> the news, but it won this year and last year, two different vintages as well. 
So I do standardize on certain features of my uh, process on the Delastage method of winemaking, which really pioneered in Burgundy, France. So that's what I follow for this. So it does really present a lot of drinkability and softness early in its youth or age. And so we're gonna present on that, but um, you know, just really it's a humbling experience that not only would best I show, but I won it two years in a row back to back of that yes. competition. So we're impressed by that oh, as well. Thank you. I'm very excited. Cheers, cheers, cheers. American thank Wine you. Society. All right. What inspired you and your family to build a winery? So the winery is owned by myself and my husband and my sister and her husband. And um, we're all from North Carolina. We love the state. But Chuck and I have lived all over the country since we've been married. In four years in the mid 80s, we lived in California in the Bay Area. And we had the chance to meet some vineyard owners. We already liked wine that really piqued our interest. So in 1990, we moved to Roswell, Georgia, and we planted a small hobby vineyard. And what can I say? The bug got us. So when we decided to, that we were going to do this, we all have always wanted to come back to North Carolina. The kids grew up. And uh, we decided we wanted to produce great wine. And so we went looking for the right place, did a lot of research that led us out to this area, and that's why we are here. The East Coast is very challenging to grow grape varieties. What varieties do you grow here, and which do you find the most challenging? Yes, the East Coast, we um, face weather a lot, the rain, the humidity, hurricanes, frost in the springtime. But that's why picking the right site was so important because this site is very protective. Any variety can be challenging, you know, depending on the year. Our largest white planting is Viognier, and Viognier can be difficult. It's a fussy grape. You have to really watch it close to harvest. So we make a very fast call to pick Viognier. So, I mean, I guess that could be a little challenging. You've done something a little bit different here. You've built an amphitheater. When we first stood on the road and had this vision of what this property would be, this was a pasture with cows on it when we found it. And the three parts of this vision were great wine first, and that was the total focus, and then great food. And though we don't have a restaurant, we bring chefs in from around the state and we do wine dinners. And the third part of that was great music. We love music. Chuck really loves music. He picks out every song on our playlist. And the vision was always to bring great musicians and songwriters and singers to our part of North Carolina. There's a lot of exciting things happening in North Carolina in the wine industry. Speaking of great wine, should we try the Petit Manhattan? We should. So Petit Mansang is a grape that we're very excited about. Um, and more and more people in North Carolina and Virginia are starting to grow it and produce it. When we first planted the vineyard, that was the only grape out of that region that we could put our hands on. And we grow two different clones of it. It is hardy in the field. It's more disease resistant. The clusters aren't so tight. The skins are a little bit thicker. And so it gives us a little less headache. Dan calls it the perfect child. It's a big white. It's very complex, full-bodied. We had a chef in Charlotte a couple of years ago call it the red wine drinker's white wine. So very full-bodied, lingers like a red. I often say if I warmed this up to room temperature and you had a blindfold on your eyes, you wouldn't know if you were drinking a white or a red. So, um, so yeah. Cheers. Cheers. <laughs> and what red do you have with us today? So, I chose Cabernet Franc because we think this is just a beautiful um, Bordeaux grape for our part of the country. And again, North Carolina, Virginia, even up into the Finger Lakes is having some really good success with Cabernet Franc. We farm it carefully, our Cab Franc. It's one of our larger red plantings. We put it on a knoll in the vineyard. It's really a premier site. The soil has a lot of schist in it. 
But yeah, this is our 2019 version. It was aged for over 40 months in French oak. We do a lot of stirring when they're in the barrel and uh, really helps with the finish and the mouthfeel. And that's one of the things you'll find with all of our red wines. We, we don't rush them out the door. We give them the time they need to develop. Enjoy. Thank you. This is a wine you can find at a lot of restaurants in North Carolina. Oh, wow, this is delicious. That's very lovely. Thank you, thank you. My name's Chip Shelton, uh, along with my sister and mother, um, we're the owners of Shelton Vineyards. We started back in 1999 for, uh, by my father, Charlie, and my uncle, Ed, um, who had bought this as a uh, old dairy farm. In 1999, we planted the first vines right behind us here. Um, and today we have over 83 acres, right at 83 acres of grapes, 10 different varieties. Just kind of been a passion of our family, started through our dad and his love for wine, which was supposed to have been a hobby when he planted a couple acres and then it turned into a full-time business. Uh, it's always been a focus of Shelton Vineyards. We focus on Bordeaux varieties first and foremost, so we grow the big red Bordeaux uh, varietals as well as Sauvignon Blanc, Chardonnay, uh, and uh, we have Riesling as well. Actually, it's interesting, Riesling's our uh, most popular variety and our most widely planted. We actually have 16 and a half acres of, of just Riesling and in the northern Yakin Valley. Um, as you can see around us, it's rolling hills. We're in the foothills of the mountains. We have the Blue Ridge Mountains right behind us. As with many wine regions around the world, um, we have a great uh, kind of mesoclimate uh, for growing quite a few different varietals and we've kind of honed in on what works well for us here. I noticed how red the soil is. So we have a, it is a red clay soil, a clay loam soil technically. I think Cecil Clay Loam is, is the, uh, the name. It's, it's a rather dense soil and over the years we've learned how to balance our, our vineyards uh, to our soil conditions. But we're pretty proud, yeah, our, our soil is pretty nutrient rich in, in certain ways, but also uh, we, we have to make some amendments so we, we want to make sure that the vines are, are healthy and, and well balanced. This is our Riesling. And um, our Riesling is our most popular wine overall, and specifically this is our sweet Riesling. We do produce a dry Riesling. We also produce a sparkling Riesling. I wanna pour this one because we've, we've really become known for our Riesling um, over the past couple decades. Oh, and we are very fortunate to have Jenny joining us. Welcome, Jenny. Come on, slide on in here. <laughs> Excellent. Super excited oh, about the videotaping today and the program as a member of the American Wine Society um, in the Winston-Salem Clemens chapter. Now, I'm pouring our sweet Riesling right now because, of course, it's a fan favorite and people really enjoy that. Uh, but we often really uh, describe how it relates back to really traditional uh, sweeter Rieslings in Germany. Overall, of course, we are a rather warm growing uh, climate and, and region. It is a delicate grape in the vineyard. And so we really kind of have to baby it a little bit more and have to monitor that. We really want those clusters nice and exposed. As you can see, we get good airflow. So it keeps the canopies nice and dried out during the growing season. Uh, with Riesling, the most important thing for me is to maintain good acidity in the wines. And so when we harvest it, our sugar levels may not be quite as high as in some regions, but it, it actually lends itself to nice acidity and really nice uh, kind of minerality as well, especially on our dry Riesling. Today we're pouring our Malbec. So uh, I chose this wine because I thought we've really, it's grown in popularity for us. We grow, we grow the, the big Bordeaux varieties and, and I include Malbec in that as well. It's really one of our most popular wines uh, for consumers because of how jammy and fruit forward it is. As is traditional with uh, the Malbec grape, you get a lot of fruit forward aromas. I really like how soft the tannins came out on this one. This is a 2021 vintage. 
We've actually got some, some pretty high scorings on this one when we've uh, sent it into competitions. But our Malbec had, certainly has the, that blackberry, plum, leaning prune, darker fruits. Very soft tannic structure. We use about 50% new oak on this wine. Um, combination of French and American oak. It's got a nice tannic structure, but it's also very round and, and supple as well. It's about the experience and about having a, this view, this location, this uh, you know rural experience. Once again, thank you for having All us. All right, absolutely. Thank you. Cheers. Cheers. here at Dobbins Creek in Swan Creek AVA. I'd like to ask, why did you decide to buy the winery here and now in North Carolina? So uh, here at Dobbins Creek, we have a restaurant group headed by Stephanie Rogel, and it's really cool to have an opportunity to have a female-owned winery here. Uh, from a family, this, this winery has been here for a long time before us. We've only been here for about two years. The beauty is really what stood apart. It was really when she came down, when she visited, when she looked around, saw the hills, saw the vines, the beauty of the area really stood out and helped her make that decision. It really is quite beautiful. I agree. You are an artisan winery. The terroir here imparts specific characteristics in the grapes grown here. How does your unique set of conditions influence the wine you make? A lot of it comes from the farming. Uh, the soil here, it's loamy, it's red clay, there's a bit of granite and it imparts these old world flavors on the wine. We're so used to American palates, big Napa, over the top ripe fruit, heavy in alcohol, and that's not what we do here. It's much more old world in style. It's elegant, it's nuanced, and the terroir and the farming techniques really play a huge part in that. Well, quality is actually an important standard in your philosophy for winemaking. What techniques and procedures is necessary to attain this vintage after vintage? So with our background being restaurants, it is really the exact opposite of what we're used to in a restaurant. So we're still learning. Uh, with the restaurant, it's go, go, go. With the winery, it's patience and it's waiting, whether it be waiting to crop the vines or waiting to harvest or, you know, just giving that a couple extra weeks in the tank to impart more flavors. You know, it's, we are learning that it's, it requires a different level of patience and with that, we're, we are still learning the techniques, but fortunately, so we bought it from someone who was very experienced, who shares a wealth of knowledge with us that we are still learning. Every time I visit, I'm learning. That's a, that's a very good comparison. That's exactly <laughs> spot on. Uh, so we have two wines here that you brought out for us to try. So why don't you pour and tell me about, our, and our members of the American Wine Society, about your unoaked Chardonnay. Sure. So this well, our Chardonnay, it's a 2021. Uh, we want to just make our Chardonnay different than what's typically here in the area. Uh, most people, you know, it's, it's the classic American mallow oaked type of Chardonnay. Uh, we just wanted to show the quality of the fruit itself. We say that this, it kind of expresses like an Albarino with a little bit of honeysuckle and citrus on the nose. Uh, it is not your typical Chardonnay. You know, we just wanted to show the quality of the fruit and left the oak, left the mallow out and just show a pure Chardonnay that's very tropical and stuff. Yeah, that has some really bright acid. It's really coming through. The next wine you have for us to try is your Cab Franc. Could you please uh, tell us about that? Sure, this is our 2019 Cab Franc, uh, and it ended up being a vintage where we harvested more fruit than what was typical. We were kind of afraid that that was the extra fruit was gonna kind of thin out the wine, but it's, it did not at all. It's very robust. Um, it's still, I think in the bottle, it, it has some time. You can lay this down for a bit and the edges will round out a little bit. I think the finish still has some time to come around but I think it's a very robust wine. You get a touch of the veggies, but the fruit is much more robust than what I was used to there. So, so. this is high elevation, Cobb? It is, it is. Thank you. Well, thank you very much for taking the time to uh, do this interview and tell us about your beautiful place. Absolutely, thank you. Cheers. Thank you.
your property's a little unique in that your family's been in this area for, what, over 220 years? How did you make the decision to take your old family stomping ground and turn it into a vineyard? The wine industry started coming back to North Carolina in about 1975. A lot of people don't know, I guess, that in the 1800s, North Carolina was the number one wine producing state. So about 1975, the vinifera grapes started coming to the area. Kim wanted to get involved in that. And I would put her in two acres of vineyard and we would see how it went. We didn't know what we were gonna do with the grapes. I was a farmer, so I knew farming, so we decided to do that. So we put those two acres in and they came along so well that a lot of people started inquiring about buying our grapes from us. When you harvest, we wanna buy you grapes. So I told Kim, I said, well, if everybody wants to buy these grapes, they must be gonna be pretty good. Let's get somebody to make the wine for us and see what happens. So we got a company to make the two wines, Chardonnay and Cabernet Sauvignon for us in 2002. And those first two wines won gold medal. We've never sold any grapes anybody. We try to grow our own grapes and make wine from it. And as our customers have requested more wine, we've planted more vineyards and now we're here today with a 10 and a half acre vineyard, a 15,000 square foot winery and a whole lot of work. <laughs> Not the retirement you were looking for. Not the retirement. To. Not the retirement. Uh, what makes Swan Creek, which is a small AVA, what makes it so unique? What really sets us apart is the soil here because this section of um, the Swan Creek was actually weathered from the Brushy Mountains, not the Blue Ridge Mountains. The Brushies are older. And so over the billions of years, that soil has weathered and has given us a sandy loam, which is very, very unique. Um, most of the Yadkin Valley is a red clay soil. Um, and we are a sandy loam. It makes the grapes love this soil because it drains better. The breezes do help a lot because it keeps the vines cooler in the summer. It also helps air movement uh, to keep the humidity levels down. So all of those really are unique to this area and made it possible for us to become the Swan Creek within the Yadkin Valley. You're not only Laurel Gray, but you also started the Yadkin Valley Wine Company. Can you explain what that is? They're small farms, five, ten acres like we are, that can't afford a facility like we have. We have everything in our facility that anybody in the world has in a facility. I mean, and the reason we can have that is because there's five companies that we make wine for. So we try to get the best winemaker available. We try to have the best equipment available. We have all the things that she needs to make great wines. And we're happy that our other customers join in and help us with that part of the overhead. Speaking of wine, let's Go ahead and have some wine and we can see what Perfect. your fantastic wine tastes like. I think we should start with the Cabernet Sauvignon. It is a lovely cab uh, with really nice, deep, rich tannins and flavor, but not quite as heavy as the Petit Verdot. So we'll save the Petit Verdot till afterwards. So this is actually a 2019. So it's been aging a while. 2019 was a wonderful year here uh, as far as the weather. We had a really nice, dry, late summer and early fall. So it made a very intense flavor. So we took extra care with this in the winery, spent some extra time and effort and money on this. And then we bottled it and we've just been letting it sit and mellow and age. So tell me what you think. That's delicious. It is, it, it is, is nice. Um, I would put this up against any cap sauce. Well, thank you. Where's the cheese? <laughs> yeah, where's the cheese? Or the chocolate. Or the chocolate, for sure. Are you ready for some Petit Verdot? I am ready for some yeah. Petit Verdot. So this is a favorite in the vineyard for me because it is a very tiny little grape. So you're gonna get the really nice, intense flavors. Um, big color, big flavor, just wonderful. With a nice big steak or a beef bourguignon or a lamb, dark chocolate. Again, back to the yeah, chocolate. chocolate. <laughs> One thing that I, we found in the vineyard is as the vines are young, you just don't get that richness and that full body and that flavor that you would like to get. So the vines have to get at least 10 years, in my opinion, age and maturity 
before you can express wines like this. Well, thank you very much. Cheers. Thank you. Hi, Jay. It's really great to be here. It's wonderful to be here at your winery. I'm Raffaldini. Been honored to meet you. I'd like to know a little bit about some of the things that intrigue you here and why you're here in North Carolina, if you don't mind sharing that with us as well. I'm first generation Italian. I had mother and father were both born in Italy. My father from the north, my mother from the central, and they came over to the States. And obviously the connection of wine is such a critical part of your it's really Southern European experience on your journey. And I wanted to start a business because family businesses tend to keep families together. And that's kind of the, the thing that makes me sad nowadays is you have this great diaspora as soon as you're done. And so the idea was, where do I start my vineyard? And I looked in the uh, only East Coast because I work in New York, it rolled out the West Coast. And there were three areas, this is in the year 2000, that I, that I looked at. Uh, one was New York, the other was Virginia, uh, the style of wine I wanted to make, it requires a lot of heat and temperature. And then I, the more research I did, I discovered that before Prohibition, North Carolina made more wine than California. So I thought, so there's a, there's a history here of growing grapes. I looked at 62 parcels to have found this one in the year 2000. And uh, now it's just, the whole area is just exploded in a wonderful way. I understand from reading about you, that your family is very influenced by the poet Virgil. Would you mind expounding on that a little? Yeah, absolutely. So uh, my father's family uh, is from the town of Mantova in the province of Lombardia, which is just in between Milan and Venice. And in the town of Mantova, it's a very small town. Uh, this is where the poet Virgil was from. My family's been in this town since 1348. So it's a long time. And Virgil is quite a profound person in Mantua. And as I kind of started to read more about Virgil, there's this one quote that's very famous that he said in one of his poems, that is, fortune favors the daring, which has sort of become our motto. And the idea is that why would you grow grapes and do something like this in North Carolina? It's because that's where the, uh, you always want to see what the potential is. And I'd rather do something in an un proven area than just follow on in a proven area. And to me, that, that was our motto and continues to be our model this day. Can you tell me why you choose the varieties you have and what varieties you do plant here? You have to start with a house style. And I see a lot of folks trying to be everything to everybody. And our house style is very narrow and specific. And our house style is big, dry, tannic reds. This is everything, this is my style, that's how. And when customers say, do you have anything? I said, no, <laughs> this, is, this is who we are, right? Once that was firm on my mind, the idea, obviously I'm only gonna plant Italian grapes because that's important. And I have 32 acres planted. I started with Northern Italians, because that's where my family's from. And I quickly realized that wasn't the best place because this is not a Northern Italian climate. And then the further south I went, the, you know, the grapes tasted, the wine tasted like it was supposed to taste. And so in the whites, we landed in Vermentino, which is our signature white. It's the only white we have, actually. So it's kind of, for me, I, that told me is that, you know, the risk is to be the same, not to be different. Um, would you mind uh, pouring us a glass? Yes. And tell us a little bit about your wine. So I'll start with the Sagrantino. So a little bit of history about the Sagrantino. Uh, it's one of the rarest grapes in the world. There's only 2,000 acres planted, which 1,900 are in one town called Montefalco. Uh, in the province of Umbria. We have nine acres planted. We have the largest planting of Sagrantino outside of Montevalgo at nine acres. Small berry, thick skin, you dry it out and uh, it really makes profound wine. And it has that classical earthy, dusty profile, which to me is the hallmark of you know, Umbrian Italian wines. This is called Sag Sagrantino. The alcohol is about 14.6. So on a lower end for us. So this one is different. So all the wines we have have the picture of the villa on it. This has a bumblebee. The bumblebee just kind of like throws itself forward at the nature. 
I should make a wine that's good in North Carolina. I defy nature. This is my bumblebee wine. That's hence the label. I make this in the style of a super Tuscan. So this should be not so earthy and dusty, but a bit more fruity and jammy because it's uh, uh, the grapes allow a little bit more of that uh, in that profile. Again, cheers and thank you. Salute. Salute. That, that is great because that leads me right to our last question, and that is, what do you see in the future of North Carolina wine? Well, I, I see um, the, the overall industry in North Carolina strengthening. So, to promise, <clears throat> one word. You know, I, I see growth. You know, there, there are so many opportunities here. There's a lot of boutique wineries that people need to visit. I tell everyone that each is a hidden gem. Um, we all are very unique and different, and they just need to come out and explore. We have well over two, 200, uh, 230 wineries or so in the state, over 400 vineyards, and that's we're really seeing that continue to grow. I think that you know we're still learning a lot, but we do have a lot of people coming into our area um, with the intention of making great wine. And you still get some great locations with great views and great growing. I mean, North Carolina is full of promise. I always ask people, what's the greatest wine you've ever had in your entire life? You tell me what the wine was, where you were, and who you were with. Everything is contextual. And, and for me, that's the joy of wine. Hi, I'm Bill Steffen, president of the American Wine Society. I'd like to thank the wineries for taking the time from their busy schedule to participate and the volunteers who worked to create this video. I'd also like to thank the members of Crew 100 for their generous donations that made this production possible. If you would like more information on the American Wine Society and Crew 100, please visit our website at AmericanWineSociety.org. Cheers. That's a wrap. That's a wrap. <laughs> <laughs>